is to keep my conscience clear before God and man. And that's kind of a different view of integrity because it's the motivating factor behind living a life of integrity. Welcome to the PAX Christian Church Podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today, and we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. So as I was preparing for this morning, which um, you guys know if you were here last week, we took a little big tour out of the book of Acts and we talked a little bit more specifically about some things that are just currently going on in our lives. But we want to get back on track this week. We want to jump back into the book of Acts. And so we're going to do that. And as I was reviewing the message notes again and revisiting what um, I'd previously wrote, this concept of integrity came to mind. And the, the sort of thread that I want you to grasp this morning as we're looking at a big chunk of scripture is this concept of integrity. And I'm sure that a lot of us are familiar with the word integrity, right? Like our culture has a lot to say about integrity. Our culture has a lot of expectations around integrity. I looked up the definition for you guys in case you were wondering what it means. Um, it's defined as the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. And you don't have to be a Christian to strive to have integrity, right? You can just try being a good person and walk around and strive to have integrity. The Bible does have a lot to say about integrity. I'm going to read just a few verses to you real quick so you can see. The the Bible does talk about this a little bit. Hebrews 13, 18 says, Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. It's living a life of integrity. Proverbs 12, 22 says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Again, there's that concept of a life of integrity looks like being truthful and honest, right? Proverbs 11, 3 says, The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Proverbs 28, 6 says, Better are the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. Another way to think of integrity is the way they talk about it in 1 Peter 3.16. It talks about keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Keeping a good conscience. We're going to hear that theme. Keeping our conscience clear. Paul says, So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. And that's kind of a different view of integrity. Because it's the motivating factor behind living a life of integrity. Another, another definition of integrity is when you think of the integrity of a structure. The integrity of all of the parts working together as one to make a solid and firm structure. The building's integrity. And that's the kind of integrity as Christians we're striving for, that we have our lives set on such a firm foundation that all of the pieces of our lives are working together toward that common goal where Christ is centered. And we're going to see that about Paul, and we're going to see how that works out for Paul as he is put on trial, as he is questioned, as his integrity really is put on the line this morning. So we're going to catch up a little bit because I realize not everybody has been with us through this series. So as we jump back into the book of Acts this morning, I'm going to give you like a little recap. Ready? Everyone's paying attention? Okay, okay. So <laughs> we are um, looking at Paul again. We're We're right at the end of his third missionary journey. So he ends his third missionary journey, travels back into Jerusalem. When he gets to Jerusalem, the brothers in Jerusalem, the microphone's real hot today. Okay, um, the brothers in Jerusalem 
uh, let him know that people are gossiping about him, that the Jews, the Christian Jews in Jerusalem, are not really happy with the things that they hear that he's teaching. So they, ha- they propose to have him go ahead and do a ritual purification when he comes back and take a Nazarite vow. And not only that, go ahead and pay for these four guys who are also doing their rites. And so Paul does it, and he does it the next day. He's like, okay, you know what? Yeah, if you're going to ask me to do that, sure, I will go ahead and do that. And we talked about that in a different sermon. If you want to know more about that, go back a couple weeks. It's there. Um, But, so he does that. He does it willingly. He goes back to the temple at the end of that time to present himself to the priests. And when he goes back to the temple, there are Jews from the province of Asia who see him, who don't like him, who stir up some trouble for him and accuse him of desecrating the temple, which creates this huge mob, this huge riot. The commander, (laughs) Lysias, gets called in with guards. They separate the mob. They take Paul into custody, and Paul asks if he can address the crowd, at which point he addresses the crowd, and he chooses in that moment to testify to the goodness of Jesus and what Jesus did in his life. He witnesses. It's the second time in the book of Acts that we have Paul's conversion story, and that's what he chooses to share with them in that moment. All right, and then after that, he talks a little bit at the end, and the crowd goes crazy. No, down with him, and there's a mob again. So he's taken into custody, and not only is he taken into custody, but that commander, Lysias, orders he to be flogged. And when he orders him to be flogged, then Paul's like, wait a second. Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen? And (laughs) that commander's like, oh, hang on a second. No, it is not legal for me to flog a Roman citizen. Uh... No, let's take you into questioning. Let's take you into custody and we'll see you. We'll put you before the Sanhedrin and we'll, we'll take you into you know, custody so we can find out more about what's happening in these charges against you. So that's what they do. They put him in front of the Sanhedrin and he's in front of the Pharisees and he's in front of the Sadducees. And they question him and he gives an account. And at the end, he talks about the resurrection and the hope of the resurrection that he has and it divides the group. So then they take Paul back into custody, they put him back under guard, and that's where we pick up the story. So we've covered a lot of ground, if you haven't been here. (laughs) So I just, you know, now you know that whole part of the book of Acts, right? You've got it memorized in here, I'm sure. Okay, so we're going to jump back in to Acts chapter 23. We're going to pick it up in um, 25. Now, between him going into custody... And where we're picking up it up in 25, page mark is there, um, where we're picking it up, not in 25, in 24. Between him going into custody and where we're picking it up, about 40 Jews have launched, they have come up with this plan to kill Paul. They've taken an oath or a vow that they are going to kill Paul. They've taken it to the high priest. They've told him about it. Paul's nephew hears about it. Paul's nephew goes and tells Paul. And Paul says, go tell the commander. So, nephew goes and tells the commander. And this is what the commander does. Chapter 23, starting in verse 25. The commander, Claudius Lysias, it says, he wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, Governor Felix, greetings. That's a normal way to address the letter. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he was a Roman citizen. That's not how that happened. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present you their case against him. Okay, so throughout our reading today, we're going to see sort of a juxtapositioning of integrity. Because what Claudius Lysias does here, he tells part of the truth, but he doesn't tell the whole truth. 
right? This is not how this happened. This event is inaccurate. And he's, he, you know, we don't know why he does it. Maybe he's hoping to avoid the fact that he almost flogged the Roman citizen, that the first question he should have asked probably was, hey, buddy, are you a Roman citizen? And gone from there because he has certain rights that were violated. But he doesn't. He doesn't give that account that way. He chooses to give the account this way. It's a part, partial truth. And what I want to ask you this morning is when was the last time that you did this? When was the last time you encountered someone else doing this? It's a small thing. He included most of the details. Most of it's right. Just the order's a little wrong. People do this for all sorts of reasons, you guys. I see it happen most commonly in the workplace where, you know, maybe you're late for work and you walk in and you're like, oh, the traffic was really bad through town. I hit every red light. Man, there was a big truck on 395 and, like, it just took, like, 15 extra minutes. Um, little, it's, and it seems like little things, or maybe you, you want to take a day off work, but you don't have a good reason. So you're like, oh, I have a doctor's appointment. Oh, my aunt passed away. Not true, but you find little reasons. Seem, they seem harmless. They seem harmless, but it's still not the truth. Why do we do that? I think there are a lot of reasons why we find ways to skirt around the truth. Sometimes I think it's fear. I think that we don't want to let people down if we miss a deadline. I think that we don't want to look like we don't know what we're doing at work. Sometimes I think that sometimes we don't want to look like we don't have it together or we just forgot something. This account that he sends is the only account that Governor Felix is receiving so far. And he's going to base a lot on this account because Claudius is, Lysias is a neutral party in this. He's not the accused. He's not the accuser. He's a neutral party. What motivation would he have to swing his account? And it's the same with our little white lies. Like Our little white lies affect our relationships with others. They affect the outcomes of things. And they degrade our relationships with others. And they degrade our ability to witness and love people well. Because when we miss those deadlines at work, Sometimes it affects our coworkers in negative ways. When we don't show up when we say we're going to show up, sometimes that affects our coworkers, our friends, our family in negative ways. And it inhibits our ability to fulfill that greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, and then the second like it, love others. And so this is important. It's important that our lives are not compartmentalized in ways that we can look at our relationship here and say, oh, well, I can tell this little fudge of a white lie. And it'll be okay. They don't care. It doesn't really hurt anybody. I mean, he acted on Paul's behalf very well. He sends a whole cavalry with Paul. He gives Paul 60 miles in a, in a night and a day to Caesarea. He acts on his behalf. He goes the extra mile. But here's this little white lie. Henry Nowen um, is an author um, and a lot of other things, but he wrote a book called Reaching Out. And in that book, he talks about living our lives as Christians, as lives of integrity, where the whole life, our entire life is connected. And there is no area in our life that we do not allow God into. And the only way that we tell those little lies in those moments are when we are holding on to that part of our life and we're not letting God in for that moment. And so it's in those moments when we have to ask ourselves, what is the loving thing to do here? Did I mess up? Yeah, I messed up. Did I drop the ball? Yeah, I dropped the ball. But you know what? I'm going to own that. Because what he could have written 
was the actual account. And what he could have said was, I failed to ask if he was a Roman citizen. As soon as I became aware that he was a Roman citizen, this is what I did. And that would have been fine. That would have been fine. We're going to see that this way of an integrated faith, where your faith is just permeating every aspect, is the way Paul lived his life, his life, his life. In fact, we're going to just continue to see a juxtapositioning of his integrity versus the other people around him as we keep going. So verse 31 through 35. Excuse me. It says, So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. Here's Governor Felix. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Now this is the governor is establishing jurisdiction. Like, are you my problem? Um, Paul is from Tarsus. Um, and, and, and so he, um, he's from Cilicia and Tarsus, and so he actually could go up a level above Governor Felix to be questioned and tried, but uh, Governor Felix is like, well, I'll just take you under here, and I'll just take care of this myself. So that's actually why he's asking that. It's, he's establishing some jurisdiction here. So the governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. So much of this that Paul experiences from this point on becomes political. So much of this is motivated not from a place of justice or, or what is right, but what is political and what will endear people to people in position to the people that they serve. So let's keep reading, and we'll see. Uh, we'll hear some more about Governor Felix as we go. Chapter 24. It says, Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor, before Felix. When Paul was called in, Tertullus, let's take a look at Tertullus' character here for a minute. Tertullus presented his case before Felix. Here's what he says. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude, but in order not to weary you further. I would request that you would be kind enough to hear us briefly. Okay. That's not true. They have not enjoyed a period of peace under Governor Felix. He has not brought about reforms that make everyone happy. This is not true. But he's endearing himself. He's ingratiating himself to him so that he can be heard and so kind of to get him on his side here. So... He says, and these are the charges that they're going to begin to accuse Paul of. And he begins with a little um, defamation, defamation. I never say that word right. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, verses 5 through 8. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is the ringleader of the Nazarene sect. And that's important that they say that because they're actually accusing him of not being under Jewish law anymore. Okay, and which for the Roman government, that's a big deal because they're allowing the Jews to practice their religion and they're upholding their laws. And so as long as Jesus is part of that, like he's really not doing anything wrong. But they're saying he's part of the Nazarene sect and even tried to and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. It's an understatement. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to learn the truth about all of these charges we are are bringing against him. Okay, so his character, he's a troublemaker. He stirs up riots all over the world. He's a ringleader of some other Nazarene sect. And he, now, this is the charge. He's attempted to desecrate the temple. This is the only thing he actually, that actually is a law that he has violated, if he did it. But they don't say 
They're not accusing him of doing it. The accusation is he attempted, okay? He attempted to desecrate the temple. That's the charge. And here's how Paul responds after, so it says, verse 12, the other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. And then here's how Paul responds. When the, governor, when the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you've been a judge over this nation. That is a very, very flat statement, you guys. He doesn't say you're a good judge. He doesn't say you're awesome and I support you and you're wonderful and you've done all these great things. He says, I know for a number of years you've been judge over this nation. True. That's true. When the governor motioned for him, okay, so he says, so I gladly make my defense, which is probably also true. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. You guys, this, all of this has happened from entering Jerusalem to, to speaking before Governor Felix. All of, all of the mob, all of the rioting, all of, the, all of this stuff has been in less than 12 days. So very fast two weeks here, less than two weeks. So it's still easily verifiable because it's recent. So he says, you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. So Paul, in contrast to Tertullus, he's respectfully but he's truthfully addressing the governor. And then he leans into that truth. He gives his alibi, his whereabouts, what he was doing. I was not with a big group of people, he says. He was above reproach. He could lean on the truth because he lived his life in a way that he was above reproach. All of the things in his life were working together so that he was living with integrity. He knew he could stand on what he had done, where he had been, what he had said in that moment. And he does. It's his defense. Verse 13, he goes on, and they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way which they call a sect. I still call it Judaism, right? So he's, he is now that one thing that they were trying to identify, like he's not part of us. He's saying, I am part of them, right? So that's an important response there. I am part of that. This is what I still believe. I believe everything, he says, that is in accordance with the law, and that is written in the prophets. And he says, I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Now that's really interesting because we know we know that Paul leans on his hope in the resurrection. We know that that is a big aspect of his faith. And often we just think resurrection, we think when Christ resurrected. And here he's also saying there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. What's he talking about? He's talking about the final judgment. He's talking about the final judgment, just like the Jews. I, too, believe that there is a final judgment and that it is coming. And here's what he says about it. He says, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. And that is the motivating factor for Paul. It's not because it's nice to be a good moral person. It's not because it's a good idea to tell the truth. It's not because... The commandment says, thou shalt not lie, although as a Jew he would have obeyed that for that reason too. But because one day, Jesus is coming back and there will be a final judgment. In Acts twenty twenty four, Paul says that his only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus gave to him. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So he strives always to keep his conscience clear before God and man. That is his only aim. And if that is his only aim, man, he's really going for it here. Why? Because he believes that there's the resurrection of the wicked and the righteous. And that one day we'll be in front of our Lord and Savior. 
He believes that. And it motivates him forward. And this idea of living this way, that we're our entire lives keeping a clear conscience before God, it's not new. It's a theme throughout the Old Testament. We see it um, in, throughout David's life. We see it in the psalm he wrote, Psalm 139, where Psalm 139, 23, sorry guys, I, I guess I'm jumping around off my notes, but Psalm 139, 23, and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And that is a prayer of someone who desires to have a fully integrated life and faith. Lord, search me and know me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense in me. And lead me in the way I want us to. Lead me in your way down your path where you want me to go. Help me to stand in those difficult moments representing you in every way. The love of Christ. Let nothing get in the way of that. Let nothing get in the way of that. Our salvation is sealed when we become Christians, guys. I don't want to confuse you on that. You become a Christian. You accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You proclaim him as a son of God that he died for your sins. You commit your life to live for him. You are are going to heaven. You are in your inheritance is sealed. This doesn't change that. But there will be a day when we stand before Jesus and we face him. And I don't know about you, but I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. I'm still going. You're still going. But I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And this is the way that Paul strives to live his life. And the, the chapter continues, and you see one more juxtapositioning of an, of an integrated life, a fully integrated life of Paul. And a, and a life that is compartmentalized. So verse 17. Paul says, After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. So now he's giving an account of what he was even doing in Jerusalem. I was ceremonially clean when they found me, which we know to be true. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who thought, sorry, who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. These guys accusing me in this room weren't even there at the beginning of this. They don't know what happened. If you would like to bring an accusation against me, bring the guys that did it from the first. Bring those Jews from the province of Asia. Have them here in this room. Let them address me. Or these who are here should state what crime, what actual crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted in their presence, it's concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Paul tells the whole truth. He even admits that he he shouted that. It caused another riot. That's what he's admitting to right there. I shouted this. If I'm on trial for that, then tell me I'm on trial for that. But let's make it about that. He's standing on his integrity. And he can do that because he knows that he did nothing wrong. Verse 22, it says, Then Felix, who is well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. I think that's so funny. Then Felix, who is well acquainted with the way, Adjourned the proceedings. He was like, oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, this isn't really about Roman law here. And here's what he says. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. When Lysias, the commander, comes, I will decide your case. He ordered a centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days pass. He still hasn't decided the case. Several days later, 
Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus, as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. When Lysias comes, I will decide your case. He didn't do what he said. Two years later, he's still in prison. Paul is still in prison. Not in prison, but under guard. Two years later, he hasn't been released. His case hasn't been decided. And the whole time, Felix is meeting with him. It's not like he just locked him up somewhere and forgot about him. He's been meeting with him, hoping to catch him. Hoping that Paul just would just slip up. At some point. But Paul doesn't because he lives his life with integrity. He has a fully integrated life, all things for Jesus. He is there. His one and only aim is to finish the race set out for him, to preach the gospel. And that's what he keeps doing every time he like, comes in. Or the one time that they tell us what he talks about. The resurrection. Righteousness. That's what he talks to Felix about. There's an offer in bribes. Felix doesn't keep his word. He doesn't do what he says he would do. Instead, he leaves Paul there. Dishonest gain, failure to follow through on our word, personal political motivations, all of those things, they stand in stark contrast to integrity and to a fully integrated Christian life. We can't have those things motivating us. We can't have those things present in our lives if we want to be able to show the love of God, the real, true love of God to the people around us. Because those things affect our relationships with people and our relationships with God. And they separate us from God. And they diminish our relationships with the people around us. We need to do what we say we're going to do. We need to be motivated not by selfish ambition, not by vain conceit, not by fear, not by worry, but by love. By love. And not just our own human love, but the love of God manifest in us, shown to others. The way God loves us, we need to love other people. So this morning, I want to spend some time in reflection with you guys. And I want to ask the question, are you living a fully integrated Christian life? Are there parts of your life you're holding back from God? You'll know because it's those parts where, you, where you're tempted, like, oh, maybe I could just fudge this a little bit. Maybe I can just take control of that a little. Are you living a fully integrated Christian life? Where the predominant theme is love for God and love for those around you. We're going to pray Psalm 139. We're going to take some time to go ahead and reflect on that question. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, search me. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts, Father. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lead us, Lord, in the way everlasting. Would you show us our hearts, God, and our actions? Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. 
If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ.